Well, everybody, um, welcome to this seminar. I'm really pleased to see you on a beautiful Canberra, Canberra spring day. It's great to have you around the table. Um, maybe one or two others may be coming, but uh, it's time to start. Um, okay. Look, it's my very great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Professor William Schweiker. Uh, Professor Schweiker is the Edward L. Is it Ryerson? Mm -hmm. Ryerson, Ryerson Distinguished Service Professor of Theological Ethics at the Divinity uh, School. Keeps on going. Um, <laughs> University of Chicago. University of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> He's editor in chief of the Wiley Blackwell Encyclopedia of Religious Ethics. Um, look, William and I uh, first met each other about not very long ago. Mm -hmm. A couple of years. Maybe. Oh, even not, a, no, not even, even not that. Even that. We we're involved in this uh, tripartite project with Heidelberg Institute with Professor Michael Velker and uh, Professor John Whitty from uh, Emory uh, University uh, Institute of Religion and Law uh, on this character formation, moral education and uh, values in Western pluralistic societies that Bill and I have just been trying to figure out what, what it's actually about. I've <laughs> been in it for a little while. Uh, it's a remarkable project and uh, we've had some uh, really wonderful uh, times together in Heidelberg. And it just so happens that uh, you've flown from Chicago over to Canberra for this particular seminar. Yes. That'll be the reason why you're here. Yes. Yeah. Other than that, you're, what's the reason why you're in Sydney? Um, well, my <laughs> significant other is uh, running the, <laughs> helping run the National uh, Alzheimer's Research Project that goes on at different continents every six months out of the national office in Chicago. And they do these regional meetings to bring together around 500 researchers um, to try to deal with the scourge of Alzheimer's. <laughs> well, I wasn't worried. I thought you might forget anyway. <laughs> so, so you're not in Canberra because our Prime Minister has been in Chicago? No. 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 Had I known. <laughs> no. But anyway. No, I'm here because of this invitation. Yeah. But uh, the bill said what about what if we could get together so I said well you come down here we'll have a seminar so this is why we're here um, you've got uh, Bill's got many things on the on the go in terms of writing and projects and I'm not going to iterate them all right now the most important thing is to attend to the paper that you're going to share with us today and then we'll have a conversation um, and you've all ought to have received a copy of that um, but notwithstanding that some of you will have read it some not some will have read parts of it some skimmed some thought deeply and not others not at all. I mean, that's my, my, my experience of these things. <laughs> so I said to, to Bill, look, read parts of it, speak to parts of it, and then we'll ha have a, a conversation amongst us. So the topic, uh, uh, dignity, a humanist perspective. I think I put it on, digni on human dignity, issues and challenges. That's it probably fine. amounts to the same thing, but yes. uh, we'll see. That's fine. So <laughs> wonderful to have you here, uh, William. Um, off, over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Stephen, and thank you, everyone, for coming this afternoon. It's a real honor for me to be here, um, real honor. Um, a couple of words about me, then about what I want to do, and then we'll begin. So um, I am really excited about what I do and what we do. In fact, I think the questions that we ponder are the ones necessary to sustain life on this little planet, and our job is to crack through the obfuscation, the idiocy, idiocy of public discourse in order to address basic human questions. It's been said that civilization is the triumph of persuasion over force. If we can't be a force for civilization, for adjudicating human problems through persuasion, we all know exactly how they will be dealt with. So I get very excited about what I do, what we do, and it's a joy to be here to do that with you. As you've already seen, I, get, I can speak rather quickly at times. If I get to going too fast, just raise your hand, tell me to be quiet. Um, we are working collegially here today, so first name, at least with me, is appropriate. Just call me Bill at least to my face, you may call me something else. <laughs> when that's another matter. I also want to thank you all for allowing me to speak in my mother tongue, uh, <laughs> since I'm not sure I'm very good at the Australian language. Uh, what we're going to do today is really attempt to reconstruct a conception of both humanism and human dignity. 
because this topic is at the core of many of the debates we see going on globally. Debates between religious and non-religious conceptions of human life. Debates about the status of human life and its dignity in relationship to other forms of life on our little planet. Questions about the status of individual well-being versus social flourishing. Questions about indigenous peoples and their rights and universal, more universal claims. All of those are funneling into the writing of this paper, which was done at the request of some editors of a volume entitled Dignity and Conflict, as you see at the top of the first page. And I was asked to write on this <coughs> from a specific perspective. By the end, you'll see I have foiled the distinction between religious and non-religious as I advance my own position, which I have called theological humanism, but more on that later. If you've read the paper, I'm sorry, I may bore you here for a while. If you uh, are following along, you might find that difficult because I've cut out a lot in order to have the first part of this seminar, the first three hours, be on the paper, then the second three hours we'll have for open discussion, okay? Hopefully it'll be an hour each. We'll see how that goes, okay? So I'm actually going to read some since Stephen asked me to do that. Um, so why don't we begin, okay? The idea of human dignity is hotly debated in the Western and increasingly global moral and political thought. Appeals to human dignity are found and contested within human rights discourse, the claims of indigenous peoples. I must note, I wrote this paper about two years ago before even thinking of coming here. <coughs> so some of the issues that are now going on in this country are prescient in terms of what I was thinking about. Uh, it's debated in terms of plans for economic development and distrib distributive justice and classical and emergent forms of democratic governance. This is the case because ideas of human dignity have always been located within the network of practices, values, ideals, and norms that structure religions, cultures, and societies. For instance, there is a profound difference between the meaning of what we now call dignity within a warrior culture, such as ancient Greece, with, where dignity had to do the hot, with height with respect to power, um, and various appeals in the biblical religions to the ideas of human beings created in the image of God. So we're dealing with a contested <coughs> concept that has different semantic fields through the history of Western civilization. My principal concern is initially going to be to identify and then deconstruct a difference between dignity as status and a constitutive definition of dignity. There seems to be a great divide between constitutive and status conceptions of dignity and between those who hold that any conception of dignity requires divine or religious sanction and those who deny the need for a religious or theistic claim. So we're working on an axis between status and, and constitutive conceptions of dignity and between religious and non-religious. Okay? We're trying to decode this concept in terms of that field. Now important for this paper is that however conceived, dignity is bound to and interwoven with a humanistic outlook on life broadly understood. Dignity and humanism are naturally bound together within the legacy of Western and nowadays non-Western thinking. For instance, there's volumes published on African humanism, Chinese humanism related to the revivals of um, certain forms of ancient Chinese thought. So the purpose of this paper is to situate the idea of human dignity both within the networks of thought and life broadly called humanistic and within the forms of religious and secular humanisms as well as anti-humanist arguments. Now, on my account, a humanist is someone who holds that human beings have a special, if not unique, important distinction, importance and worth within the myriad forms of life on earth 
and this is shared by all human beings. The idea of dignity is thereby a natural way to articulate, define, ad and advance the importance and worth of human beings and to designate its universal scope. The point of central dispute is the source of human dignity, and if it does or does not link human beings to some transcendent or sacred reality. My argument's going to move along three lines of inquiry. First, I isolate some generally shared convictions held among humanists. Now, this is my reconstruction of what we mean by humanism. I'm not sure all humanists would agree with it. Those that don't are obviously wrong. <laughs> but I'm trying to reconstruct a stance in life, how we see and evaluate the world around us and ourselves. Secondly, I will briefly map a typology of humanistic positions with respect to whether dignity is a term for the status an individual has in a community or whether it's constitutive of being human. And, as I said, the other axis is whether it's religious or non-religious. Finally, based on that reconstructive and typological work, the first two moves of the paper, I sketched two challenges to the future of human dignity and then briefly note my own humanist response to them. This conclusion will draw on deep humanistic ideas about human dignity and the worth of, human, of worth of life itself. The point of the argument is that a humanistic conception of dignity is, not, is found not simply in the distinction and relation between status and constitution, or even between religious and non-religious sanctions for dignity. A humanistic idea of dignity is to be found in how the set of convictions to be analyzed provide a framework within which dignity and its features are understood and what that means for the orientation of a life worthy of our humanity. In this respect, what is distinctive about a humanistic conception of dignity is the framework of convictions that motivate life dedicated to respecting and enhancing the dignity and the integrity of life as a whole. In other words, one of the things I'm also doing is shifting the notion from some predicate we make about a human being, their status or what constitutes them, to the forms of life we adopt. That response, being responsible is what makes us human. And therefore, we have to find dignity within respect, with respect to our capacity to be responsible. I can elaborate more on that later if you like. So next, uh, shared convictions. Throughout the ages, in my reading, humanists have shared interconnected ideas about the meaning, value, and purpose of being human. First is an ontological conviction. The most, in some sense, counterintuitive conviction shared by humanists was forcefully put forth in the 15th century in Pico's famous oration on the dignity of man. Pico's claim, as you remember, is that human beings have no set or determinate nature but we may rise to moral heights or fall into brutishness through our own will and action. Human beings, in other words, are incomplete projects and so have the task to fashion and define their individual characters and communal lives. Obviously, closely related to the idea of dignity as status, since you can rise or fall, the deeper claim here of Pico is that human beings are complex, mixed beings, neither reducible to sheer matter and biological processes, nor souls somehow trapped in bodies. Rather, human beings must navigate the various and sometimes conflicting 
desires, thoughts, and values that permeate experience. I don't know about you, but I have conflicts between desires, values, and have to make sense of those, integrate them, in order to constitute our lives with some measure of wholeness or integrity. Human project is to bring some integrity to our existence within the amazing conflict and tensions we experience. Given this ontological convictions, humanists then see freedom as a fundamental value. But freedom is neither the capacity to leap out of one's context in a radical act of, act of choice to constitute oneself, a rather existentialist account of freedom, nor is freedom epiphenomenal to be explained in terms of deeper <coughs> um, biological or biochemical, physical or metaphysical forms of determinism. Rather, freedom is valued and is real but limited. It is precious but vulnerable to the forces of the world, others and ourselves. As the British philosopher Mary Midgley once put it, freedom is the whole self acting on the whole self to bring some measure of coherence to existence. Now, related to the ontological conviction about human beings is a second, an epistemological conviction. That is, what is the character of human knowing? The medieval thinkers put it this way, Thomas Aquinas, and I think this is a, a deeply um, humanistic conception. Thomas noted in the Summa Theologica, quote, things are known according to the mode of the knower. Unquote. In other words, our mode of being determines how we can know things. This means two things with respect to human beings. First, as mixed beings, human beings always know things through a combination of sensation, ideation, imagination, and language. We, we can't know in any profound sense outside of those mediating structures. It's just the way we're built. Um, it may be possible to have immediate insight into the divine being or immediate zap of divine revelation, but most of the Western intellectual and theological tradition has understood the importance of mediations. And, um, humanists insist on this point for reasons we may want to come to. And this is why humanists have typically stressed the study of languages and of literature and of cultural forms and of history because those are the ways we know things given our mode of being. Second, this epistemological principle of humanism carries with it a challenge to work to, the, to which the work of interpretation is an answer. That is, insofar as human beings are mixed creatures and freely shape their character in the direction of their lives, the epistemological point and the ontological point, then come what may, human beings are going to understand things differently given the tenor of their lives. The saint and the sinner, no less than the wise and the foolish, or the rich and the poor, simply see and know different worlds. Human beings inhabit different, if we hope at times, overlapping worlds of meaning. And this means to be human is to be an interpreter because we have to interpret what others are saying to us given their mode of being in the world and our own. So a consequence of the fact that human beings inhabit different emotional, linguistic, moral, political, culture, gendered, and racial worlds is that the work of human knowing and understanding is always and irreducibly through the labor of interpretation. We're hermeneutical beings moving between domains of meaning. We inhabit 
What we interpret, excuse me, are the practices, myths, symbols, concepts, and narratives that human beings make to understand and to orient their lives. Humanists, therefore, have advocated both the study of hermeneutics, that is, the art of interpretation, and rhetoric, the art of persuasion, even while they hold a very healthy mistrust, in fact, a skepticism, about our capacity to ever know anything in an undistorted or certain fashion. Now, from the ontological and the epistemological conviction, let's go to a third. Is everyone with me so far? Clear as mud, but that covers the ground, as they say. <laughs> now, humanists, and one of the reasons why I, I love doing this stuff and identify with this, is they just simply revel in the odd, quirky, diverse ways of being human. The diversity of human characters can be the subject of joy, scorn, satire, praise. Think of Erasmus's praise of folly, or John Kennedy Toole's The Confederacy of Dunces, or Cervantes' Don Quixote, all very deeply humanist texts. Such delight and criticism expresses, however, a third basic convictions. Probably very debatable one here. We're getting more debatable. Humanists hold that human beings are progressive beings. Well, what does that mean? It means that it's possible for human beings to improve their life, to seek more noble or refined character, to fashion more relatively just and humane communities, but also, as we noted with Pico, to fall from this. The idea of humans as progressive beings can take various expressions, but the point is that humanists seek to perfect, but not to overcome our all too human mode of being in the world. Now, the distinctive humanist conception of human beings as progressive creatures is why humanists have always been concerned with education. Education in the broad sense, in German it would be Bildung, we would now talk about character formation, um, the humanities from the Latin or paideia in the Greek, all are bound to the study of civic life, to language, grammar, philosophy, and law, but also to those practices and institutions will, which will help to shape human beings to progress, to become better. Insofar as human beings are progressive creatures, then education ought to serve to respect and enhance the integrity of human life. It's very interesting, if you go around the world and look at mottos of universities, I don't know what yours is, but um, Humboldt University is the University of Letters. Johns Hopkins University in the United States is the trust to truth will set you free. My home university of the University of Chicago is Crescott Sciencia Vita Excalator. Let knowledge grow from more to more so that life might be enriched. The modern university system, more or less, is built, although this is under attack, folks, we may want to talk about this, is built on this deep humanist premise that we are progressive beings. And therefore, we can think about how to shape our lives as exercises of freedom. So here, too, one sees the importance of hermeneutics and rhetoric for humanists to learn means to come to understand others, oneself, and one's world through the interpretation of whatever makes a claim on us, especially the hum whole human realm of culture. Social life, it, if, if it isn't to endure and not tumble into the fires of hatred and conflict, 
must supplant force with persuasion, as I've noted before. Fourth conviction, an axiological one, that is, a conviction about what has value. So this is a conviction about what has value or worth. And for a humanist, a human, human being has unconditional worth or dignity. Here we need a crucial distinction introduced by Immanuel Kant, another great humanist. And that is the distinction between worth, verde, and price. Unfortunately, in English, when we use the term value, that distinction is often elided. So that we think that something has worth if we can give price to it. I don't know about this country, but that's certainly the case in the United States. Education now becomes a matter of how much you charge students. Students expect the worth of their education to pay off in a nice economic job. Human beings can be marketed. Um, that's, that's called slavery, right? Um, so we need this distinction, and this is really what's at stake in fighting for human dignity, is to not allow, allow the um, slip from worth to price. Human beings are part of the community of life on this planet, but for the humanist, no other living species is of equal worth with human beings. This is, yet it's also the case that the community of life does not exist or derive its value from its utility for human beings. Human beings, or humanists, despite their critics, are not necessarily anthropocentric in terms of their value. I'll come back to this later. Even if the humanist wants to insist that we have a distinctive worth or dignity, which I'm saying our distinctiveness rests in our capacity to be responsible for other forms of life. It is found in the human responsibility for itself and for other forms of human life on this planet. Now, it's enough to note here that the humanist conception of dignity or intrinsic worth, we can get in debates in axiology about intrinsic, non-intrinsic, the in ingression of value on non-value. We can get onto all those debates if you want. Um, but the point here is that this notion of dignity is interwoven with the three other convictions I've noted that humanists hold. But it is also, this leads to the next conviction, bound to different conceptions of self-transcendence. And by self here, I don't mean the individual necessarily, but the capacity of human beings to transcend themselves, and even communities to transcend themselves. Insofar as self-respect and responsibility for others exceeds and transforms one's actual life, into a condition that can manifest and or achieve the dignity of every human being. So now, what is, how do we think about this odd capacity of human beings to go beyond themselves? We do that in terms of seeking some measure of improvement. We do this in terms of responses to value or worth, price or worth. How do we think about this capacity of self-transcendence? Religious humanists seem to share three points on this issue that can be illustrated with respect to classical Christian humanism. And then we'll take up different models of transcendence. The main distinction, well, we'll come, we'll come back to this in a moment. The first point shared by religious humanists is that God, or the divine, or the sacred, however you want to name it, can be known and experienced with respect to a humanist framework of our other four convictions. 
In other words, the human divine relation does not destroy nor negate the distinctly human mode of life on its ontological, epistemological, axiological levels. This is why, historically speaking, Christian humanists often focus their theological reflection on Jesus as the Christ, since in Christ the divine is incarnate in human form. As St. Athanasius put it in one of the famous dictates of the patristic period, God became man so that we might become God. The divine does not despise the human condition, but in fact dwelt among us as a fully human being. And I think we have to be honest as scholars of religious traditions, religious traditions oftentimes do despise the human condition. And that's a profoundly non-humanistic take on what religions are. This first point is related to a second. Religious humanists hold that the reach, depth, and scope of our humanity is greater than their religious colleagues believe. Indeed, humanity reaches into and participates in the uh, sacred. No wonder then that Christian humanists have held that the core of the religious and moral life is the love of God and the love of neighbor as oneself. Human love is a form of lateral and vertical transcendence. Sometimes, and this is one of the most radical points in the New Testament, I think, sometimes, as in the thought of St. Paul, the point is pressed to the extent that the two forms of the love command are united as he writes in Galatians 5.14, but you can also find it in Leviticus 19.18, Matthew 7.12, 19.19, and John 13.34. This is fairly radical. The two commands are reduced to, in Paul's terms, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This reading of the double love command in terms of the golden rule shows the profoundly humanistic understanding of transcendence in Christian thought, which has parallels in other religious traditions. This conception of transcendence in terms of the love of God and neighbor among Christian humanists, with their insistence on a humanistic framework of thought and life, relates to the final third point shared among different kinds of religious humanists. Uh, Irenaeus put it well in terms of Christian thought, quote, the glory of God is man fully alive. For a Christian humanist, this aliveness, in other words, as created beings, we're not yet fully alive. We have to progress into life. For a Christian humanist, this aliveness is found in Christ and not simply in oneself. And the divine glory is not simply a matter of the divine self-relation, God relating to God's self, but in vivifying human and non-human life. It is in this light that Christian humanists understand human perfection. What should we be struggling towards? Well, it's to be fully alive in love. And that's the glory of God. Now, in our current global situation, perhaps the most pressing task facing religious people, in my judgment, is to humanize, along the lines I've just given, to humanize their religious commitments and practices. I didn't, since I don't have my um, phone, I don't know what time it is. I don't know how long have I gone on. Too long, everyone says. <laughs> All those agree not. 20 minutes. <laughs> oh, okay, so I'm fine. I'm doing okay. Yeah, yeah. you, you, you can uh, rein me in when I, okay. All right, now we're turning from the reconstruction of humanism to the analytic task of distinguishing the two types <clears throat> of dignity that is dominating a lot of philosophical and religious thought, okay? Because I want to break down the distinction. So having analyzed some convictions that are basic to a broadly humanistic outlook, 
and a conception of dignity, it's now possible to set up a typology of humanism on the question of human dignity. What is sought here is a map of options within which specific positions can be roughly located. For the sake of uh, brevity, I refer to religious and non-religious forms of humanism together, realizing they take many different forms. So first, dignity as constitutive of being human. For many religious and non-religious humanists, dignity or intrinsic worth is simply written into our being. This dignity might be predicated on reason as the principle of specific difference between human (coughs) beings and non-human creatures. Or it might be designated as the image of God stamped on the human soul by God in creation. Others, such as Kant, argue that dignity is found in the human capacity to legislate laws for our own free action. Without further detail, the point of these positions is that human dignity is a constitutive part of our humanity and thereby inscribed in each and every human being. It is universal in scope. The question then becomes, as the sad histories of racism and sexism attest, is not who among human beings have dignity, since per definition all humans have dignity, the question then becomes, oddly enough, who is or who is not truly human? This has been the history of sexism and racism, right? So women are not completely human, or blacks in the state are not completely human. We all know these, I think you have it in your own country, this problem. Once acknowledged as genuinely human, Individuals and communities have irreducible worth. They are ends in themselves. And this means that dignity is intrinsic to human be- humanity, but vulnerable because one's humanity can be denied. So an odd paradox. Humanity is intrinsic to your, uh, dignity is intrinsic to your humanity, right? But your humanity can be denied. It must be admitted that in the history of Western thought, this conception of dignity as a vulnerable but intrinsic fact of being human has been a two-edged sword. Specific conceptions of being human, say the human as a rational social animal or the human as a member of a specific community, polis or race, have been used to exclude people from the recognition of their dignity. Now let's get a little closer to the bone here and ask a question. Do any of you know what many of the native aboriginal tribes in this country, what their term for themselves means? Do the same thing with Native Americans in India, in the United States. Right. So there we have the problem. If you're human, it is constitutive of your being to have dignity. You're part of the tribe. But if you're not part of that tribe, Got a problem, right? And this is the same thing that happens in uh, the United States and Native Americans. It was true uh, among the ancient Greeks. A barbarian in ancient Greek was someone who was simply heard to speak like this. Ba, 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 ba. To be human was to be Greek. This is just a fact of our world, and that's the vulnerability I'm trying to get at with this constitutive notion. Sadly, too often, peoples have identified being human with an exclusive group, with their own race or group, and thus allied the universal scope of human dignity. And indeed, many criticisms of humanism itself focus on the failure of those who speak of human dignity to acknowledge it to those outside of their cultural, racial, and ethnic identities. This has blown up in the United States recently with respect to Thomas Jefferson, the great writer of you know, emancipation and freedom who has slaves and fathered 
children with slaves. It's related to the insistence on the inferiority of women by people like Rousseau and others. But remember, con the constitutive idea of human dignity is two-sided. There is also the idea of a universal intrinsic dignity, whether endowed by God or simply a, human, uh, a feature of human being. The other side is that this conception has exerted pressure on societies and political institutions to extend human, social, political, ethnic, racial, and sexual rights to all people. Indeed, the many and various movements of, social, of civil rights around the world, from India with Gandhi to the United States and from South Africa to China, are unimaginable without this constitutive conception of the intrinsic worth and dignity of human beings. So on the one hand, the idea is vulnerable because it can get trapped in a specific group named human. On the other hand, this same conception can exert immense force um, to extend the rights and the acknowledgement of dignity to other people. Insisting on the constitutive value of human dignity sets an agenda, a task to be undertaken, undertaken so that the dignity of all people will be recognized simply in virtue of their humanity. How about dignity as the status of a human being? Let's turn to that. The most ancient conception of dignity was linked to the status an individual could attain in relation to the moral, religious, and cultural values of a specific community. It's interesting, in the ancient Greek world, this is the Homeric discourse before the so-called Socratic Enlightenment, virtue or excellence could be predicated of anything that fulfilled its function <clears throat> to the highest degree. This is a status. So in Homer, you can speak of a virtuous ship, a virtuous shield, a virtuous helmet. Think of Achilles' shield. Um, those you could predicate excellence and worth to something that fulfilled its function to the highest degree. Aristotle takes this so far to say, is there a human function? Yes, there is. It's to guide your life rationally. If one guides one's life rationally, and as a man, and as a citizen, and has fate on their side, you can have a lot of dignity, a lot of worth. So in this context, dignity was not a given yet vulnerable constitutive feature of being human, but rather an excellence, a height, a supremacy achieved by individuals and communities. Nowadays, this is limited to sports figures <laughs> and movie stars <laughs> that we somehow think achieve the heights of human excellence. In other words, one had to have a specific status within a community. But this meant, ironically, that dignity can be won or lost and was not an attribute of the human qua human. Think of Patroclus or Antigone, if you want to use the ancient Greek examples. The idea of dignity as status does, however, capture a deeply held humanistic conviction. It's one I noted before. Human beings are progressive creatures. We can excel. It also expresses the profoundly social nature of human life. Insofar as a dignified status is always defined by the values of some community and recognized or not within that community. Because of this progressive understanding, dignity as status became linked to ideas about 
a defining function of human beings, um, such as reason. And at that point, Aristotle is starting to push towards, if we go to the ancient world, a constitutive notion of human beings. But he doesn't make it because uh, the status of someone is always with respect to the polis, not with respect to humanity qua humanity. Now, many of the same criticisms that have been leveled at the constitutive conception of human dignity have also do dogged claims about dignity as status. After all, if the criteria for recognizing dignity as a community based, is community based, and the community does not esteem the virtues of some people, say women, or denies other the capacities to attain dignity, say slaves, or contends that one is born into a specific caste that last, lacks dignity, then dignity cannot be a universal attribute of being human. Further, if dignity resides in the excellence of some capacity or function constitutive of the human as such, then those deemed non-human or subhuman simply lack dignity. It's important to realize that in the Roman world, a slave was called a speaking tool, not a human being. They had the capacity to speak, but not reason, and they were tools. In the same way, a conception of dignity grounded in capacity or function also opens a path to dignity for those previously excluded. Here's the other side. When and where an individual does in fact excel in action and achieve an excellence, say in arts, athletics, the military, and so on, in this respect, dignity as status has also been a two-edged sword in the social history of the West, at least. It has been used both to not deny and also to grant dignity to individuals and communities. Next, the paradoxes of dignity. Again, you all with me? Yeah, okay. We're doing a deep dive into the analysis of ideas because, my friends, as thinkers, the only tools and weapons we have are ideas. And if we're sloppy with them, we'll do immense damage. So it's very important when making arguments to take the time to embed concepts historically and to understand how they function. Enough of my classroom lecture. Now, it's not surprising that human is it itself, given its intimate connection to the discourse of dignity, has come under criticism. Some have argued that humanism is anthropocentric, either denying the sovereignty and supremacy of the deity or denying the worth of non-human animals through an invidious speciesism. See Peter Singer. Other critics advocate a form of anti humanism insofar as they seek a completely different semantic and conceptual framework for understanding being human, -y, human and the vocation of human beings. Likewise, current strands of thought called transhumanism and posthumanism seek to transcend through technological and biochemical means the form of existence that we have, which is bound to death. One uh, famous transhumanism said that the, that the purpose of their movement was a war on death. All these movements and thinkers challenge a humanistic understanding and framework for articulating the status as well as the vulnerability of human dignity. Now, rather than considering those various critics, I think it's more apt to note two paradoxes of dignity so conceived, a conceptual paradox and a social paradox. The conceptual paradox is this. If dignity is constitutive of human beings, then it would seem that there is no reason to defend it, since per definition, it is simply given with a human existence and in that respect, invulnerable to human action. Conversely, if dignity is vulnerable, this might undercut any notion of equality and universality to the concept of dignity, and thus pose 
practical challenges to defense. Yet at least within a humanist framework, these two basic forms of dignity, the two basic forms of dignity, status and um, constitutive, can, I'm wanting to argue, be interrelated because each is implicated in the other. If dignity as status relies on some conception of a constitutive function of human beings, this is why I said Aristotle's pushing in this direction, then the two di ideas can be related. Likewise, dignity of, as constitutives lays out the task of recognizing all people as having equal dignity and therefore a notion of status. If not in theory, in other words, at least in practice, the two forms of dignity within humanistic thought imply each other and thereby elide what I've called the conceptual paradox. Matters are equally complex with respect to the social pro uh, paradox, as I'm calling it. In order to make any appeal to dignity, there must be someone who can recognize and respond to that dignity. The responses might be one of neglect, denial, abuse, esteem, or respect. But someone must recognize the call of dignity for it to have any social impact. This is why uh, liberation movements around the world are demanding to be recognized. Without the recognition of dignity, it becomes a social uh, non-starter. The paradox here is whether conceived as constitutive dignity or dignity as status or some interrelation of those forms, each is interde interdependent with a response of recognition. Lacking recognition, the claim of dignity persists, but it lacks moral, political, and religious salience. This is why the discourse of recognition has exploded on the scene in the last 10 years or so. Indeed, a basic humanistic concern is how best to hone and tutor one's perceptions so as to recognize and respond to the claim of other people's dignities. Human, humanists of various stripes have advanced three related but different accounts of moral perception, a religious one, a social account, and a broadly phenomenological. And assuming I have time to do this, I'll go through those real quickly. Do I have time? Five minutes, oh, well, maybe we should turn to it. Very briefly, the point is, is that we can hone our ability to recognize the dignity of another human being through religious practices. Uh, we can do this within social movements. And we can also try to give an account of the phenomenology, as someone like Emmanuel Levinas has done, the phenomenology of moral perception. But all of those, as I'm arguing, are honing our basic capacity to perceive, recognize, and respond to the dignity of human be other human beings. So now I want to turn to the future of dignity on Earth. There are two major challenges to human dignity now defining the future of human and non-human life. One challenge is to the idea of human nature is the claim that we should, as transhumanists argue, seek to transcend or overcome our human lot through technological and biochemical means in a war against the reality of death. At stake here is the question of the degree to which human beings' dignity is bound to the created and or evolved constitution of our species and whether or not the radicality of this question I think is not oftentimes taken seriously, whether or not we can and ought to affirm that it's good to die, that it's good to be finite. Transhumanism and certain other positions are not only a war on death, they're a war on finitude. They're a war on it being good to be finite. A lot of religious discourse is actually nihilistic in this sense. 
the future of dignity, human dignity, is then the future in which human finitude is respected and treasured as a necessary condition for the enhancement of life. The second challenge is the interconnectedness of all forms of life on the planet. The environmental challenges, as we all know from Greta Thunberg, powerful talk before the UN, we are not floating above this planet. This is our home. This is where we are. Given the essential interconnectedness among forms of life on, uh, on this planet and the fact of human distinctiveness, that distinctiveness is found most basically in the responsibility human beings bear for the integrity of life. The dignity or intrinsic of non-human life now demands recognition. Now, in order for the dignity of human life to incite action aimed at addressing the manifold economic challenge, uh, ecological challenges we face, our moral perception of the goodness of the community of life must be tutored and refined. And here, too, a humanist conception of education and moral perception can become important. In the face of these threats to the future of dignity on Earth, our own dignity and that of non-human life, we can no longer forestall decisions about how to respect and enhance the integrity of life. The dignity, to conclude then, from human dignity to the integrity of life. This is my revision of this form of thought I've been laying out. The dignity of human nature and the worth of non-human life form the horizon of this particular inquiry. They open up again inquiry into the most basic tenets of humanism, namely that one can and must speak of the intrinsic worth of being human and that humans are in some measure distinctive in worth in relation to other forms of life on earth. How should we formulate the dignity of human beings once the scope of worth is seen to exceed human existence, even as human beings have a distinctive responsibility for future forms of life? The movement from classical humanism to neo, what's called neo-humanism is found in a shift from the development and perfection of the self to responsibility for the other. The task now, I suggest, is to advance even another form of humanism that interrelates human dignity with the worth of non-human life. And the centerpiece of this kind of humanism is what I have called the integrity of life, seeing human dignity is found in responsibility to respect and enhance the integrity of living things. This shift in axiology must be matched with a new engagement between humanistic convictions and religious convictions. I call that outlook, that re-engagement between religion and humanism, theological humanism, the moral and religious focus of which is responsibility for the integrity of life on this planet. But however named, uh, this paper is sought to demonstrate how and under what terms humanism remains an indispensable voice in the global debate about human dignity. Thank you.